Hello there. Um, my name is Laura Cameron. I am uh, giving a talk today virtually from home. I was supposed to uh, give this presentation, this workshop in person, but uh, was sick and unable to make it. So just uh, recording this workshop um, today. And I'm going to share my screen here with some slides. There we go, hopefully that is visible. Um, so the workshop, uh, the discussion that I wanted to have today is around um, building and envisioning a future beyond fossil fuels um, and specifically talking about organizing for a just transition in Manitoba. And I'll get into exactly what that is. Um, but first I'll introduce myself. I'm. Uh, my name is Laura. I'm a community organizer with the Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition and also a researcher and climate policy um, wonk, for lack of a better term, climate policy uh, expert in living in Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory. Um, and uh, so my this sort of material is informed by both the research that I've done and also community organizing efforts for climate justice um, here on Treaty 1 territory. So to situate ourselves in this conversation, um, I'm, uh, yeah, we recognize that this is Treaty 1 land and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, I'm, I always think back to this book that Aimé Kraft wrote, Anishinaabe, scholar um, and expert on uh, water knowledge and treaties. She wrote a book called The Making of the Stoneport Treaty, which talks about um, you know, the differences in understandings between settlers and indigenous peoples um, of what treaties were and are. And um, I think that it's really informative when we talk about this question of climate action and protecting the land um, to think about, you know, what the original interpretation of like that many First Nations had of Treaty One, for instance, was more of an agreement of how to take, how to share the land and how to take care of the land together. And I think, you know, that's very different from obviously what has played out and what settler interpretations and um, uses of treaties were, but I think it's very important for our work on climate change to, you know, re revisit those treaties and understand them from Indigenous perspectives. So you may remember last summer in Winnipeg, um, this just this past summer, uh, we had days in Winnipeg looking like this. Um, you know, this was one of the uh, most intense fire seasons that we had on record across the country. Um, and, you know, Winnipeg, even though we didn't have forest fires right around the city, we definitely were not immune to um, the impact of these fires. And I'm sure lots of you um, experienced that. And I think, you know, we're clearly at, at a crossroads right now. And um, in terms of climate action and the urgency that's ramping up, um, and we're seeing, you know, even places that are quite insulated from climate climate change, relatively speaking, like Winnipeg um, being in the global north and, you know, not not right in the boreal forest. Um, we're still, you know, facing those impacts. And I think that this can be a really hard thing to um, look look at these apocalyptic images over and over again in the news um, and, you know, in our lived experience, especially when we don't see what we could do about it. So today um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do, ways that we can take action. Um, but first, I just wanted to invite you to think about, take a moment and think about what, you know, what what are the alternative images to those images that we see increasingly often on climate impacts, forest fires and flooding and whatnot? What does a world beyond fossil fuels look like? Um, and you know, if governments, if the Canadian government and other governments around the world acted 
quickly to mitigate climate change and followed the advice of climate scientists and experts to rapidly curb our emissions. And, you know, we know that we're already locked into a certain amount of climate change, but at least, you know, we're successful in limiting warming to 1.5 degrees globally, which is the, the global target in the Paris Agreement. What does that world look like? So I invite you to just um, close your eyes if you wish and take a moment to sort of think about what what is that look what is Winnipeg and Manitoba look like what does your neighborhood and your household look like without the use of fossil fuels and also without um you know without worse ever worse and worse climate impacts um and just to try to take a moment to see what that explore what that could look like and also how that feels in, you know, what does it feel like to think about these things? So, yes, as I said, I don't think we that we spend enough time um, really imagining a world beyond fossil fuels. And one concept that I want to talk about today um, I think can help us do that. And that's the idea of a just transition, which talks about how can we transition off of fossil fuels? Um, what are the solutions that we need to move towards? And how do we do that in a way that really works for communities and especially those that are most impacted by climate change? And I just wanted to share this video quickly. When we design when we designed the comprehensive three-year Just Transition Plan back in 2022, it was clear that to rapidly decarbonize while confronting the deep inequality and systemic injustices of our times, we simply had to put our economy back in the service of people and the planet. And it was equally clear that there was an excellent, if long neglected, policy tool for achieving many of these goals. Public ownership. When a corporation is publicly owned, you don't see the price gouging, serial layoffs and relentless quest for profit above all that you see with private monopolies. And you can concentrate on maximum employment, social benefits and getting essential goods and services into people's daily lives as quickly and cheaply as possible. The market is not designed to put people first. And when it comes to the climate emergency, it was clear many more than three years ago that market mechanisms like carbon pricing and offsets had utterly failed to lower emissions. So in 2022, we launched our national inventory process, identifying the key goods and services that were needed most urgently and that the market was unable to provide at the time. At the same time, we identified economic assets that were underutilized, that the market didn't place value on. Idle factories, valuable metals and minerals sitting in landfills, hundreds of thousands of eager and capable workers who wanted to make a decent living and who wanted to make a real difference in their communities. And then, just like during the fight against fascism in the Second World War, we created dozens of public corporations. We were able to create more than one million jobs while rapidly decarbonizing and reducing inequality at the fastest rate we've ever seen in history. And some examples of this, in three years we've produced millions of heat exchange systems that run on clean electricity, keeping families warm in the winter and cool in the summers. As a huge public company, we have the market power to make sure that our supply chains are sustainable and in right relation with communities around the world. We are aiming for no more extractive industries and no more extractive practices. Public ownership in the energy industry has drastically diminished the power of fossil fuel corporations and finally put communities in charge of their own energy needs. We created a huge thriving renewable industry and we did it not only by repurposing the materials and expertise of the fossil fuel industry, but also by applying a strong life cycle assessment to all of this infrastructure. Putting people's needs and the ecological limits of our planet at the heart of the economy changed everything. When we, when we designed the... Apologies. Just 
go to the next slide. So that video um, was from the the breach, um, and obviously it it is a not a real press conference. It is a, was a fictional press conference from the future from the Ministry of Just Transition, um, which is something that grassroots groups have been um, advocating for to you know become real at the federal level. Um, so this was one of the tools that they use, but I thought it was a really powerful way of thinking, you know, thinking all the way through what does it look like to transition off fossil fuels? How do we do that in a way that, you know, what are some of the ideas of doing that um, in a way that really supports communities? Um, and so when we think about the term just transition, um, which we may or may not be familiar with, um, this term has been around for um, many, many years. Um, and in general, it talks, it sort of refers to um, equitable and inclusive decision making um, in, in a transition. So, you know, economic transitions are happening um, all the time, and a just transition sort of um, speaks to the idea of having more of a planned transition and that workers and communities and people who are most affected by that shift um, should be at the, you know, have a seat at the table um, and that their, their interests should be prioritized. Um, above, you know, the the private sector or the industry that is transitioning. So the origins of this term actually come from the labor movement. So in U.S. labor organizing um, back in the 1990s and even earlier, um, they were organizing against job losses under environmental regulations. And so there was a fear that, you know, environmental regulations, if they didn't take workers rights into consideration would have a negative impact for um, workers in certain fields. And so Just Transition came about to advocate for, for workers saying, yes, we need these environmental regulations, but we also need, we need retraining and we need community support. And, um, you know, we need a more environmentally friendly approach to industrial production that really includes workers and communities in the process. And more recently, the term has been adopted, I would say, by the climate movement to talk about a just transition in the energy sector um, and more broadly, a just transition societally away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, and so it has, I wouldn't say, any singular kind of definition. There's many different ideas of what a just transition means in terms of climate change, but um, I think at the heart of it is that, you know, a transition away from fossil fuels that really addresses the inequality that is sort of under underlying the current um, fossil fuel economy that we have and, you know, that has been created through the process to get us here. In these pictures, um, there's this is just a, on the left, a picture of a um, workbook that comes from uh, the Justice and Ecology Project on Just Transition, which is quite useful. And on the right, some pictures from um, actions that we've had at the MENA, uh, organized by the Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition in the last couple of years, um, advocating for a just transition. So yeah, at the heart of it is the fact that climate change and inequality are very much linked. Um, and apologies for the poor resolution on this um, image here that I took out of a recent report from Canadians for Tax Fairness. Um, but essentially, it just shows that, you know, emissions from the richest and the sort of 1% of society of in Canada of Canadians um, have gone up, you know, hugely since the 1990s and emissions from the majority of people have, you know, per capita emissions have actually decreased and ultimately we know that you know the the um industries and the 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 wealthy few are contributing vastly and disproportionately to the climate crisis and um a just transition talks about addressing inequality and climate change um at the same time so as we transition away from fossil fuels how are we also addressing the um you know, the inequality that, that exists in our capital capitalist system. 
Um, and there's some good news, which is that there is a lot of momentum building for just transition policy, I would say, um, and sort of related policies. Right now, the federal government is working on sustainable jobs legislation. It's just passed second reading in the House of Commons, um, and it will probably become a law next year. And that legislation looks at supporting, um, you know, creating bodies in government to set up programs that can help workers in a given community or region whose jobs um, are affected by the transition off of fossil fuels. So those could be in oil and gas sector or in other high emitting sectors or, you know, the, the secondary industries that are, um, you know, built around those, those high emitting sectors. Um, there's also uh, regional roundtables that the federal government is engaging with the provinces. So they're sort of bilateral tables where they're talking about, you know, what is the, the future of um, energy uh, and resources in each region. And so that's, I think, uh, a window of opportunity to influence in the direction of a just transition that we want to see. Um, we also see unions pushing for just transition programs. Um, we've seen unions in Manitoba pass motions related to upholding um, and, you know, living out the principles of a just transition. Um, we've seen a provincial government, uh, the new provincial government commit to creating green jobs, for instance, um, in their commitment to um, no cost, like transitioning 5,000 residential homes to geothermal um, with heat pumps and creating uh, many jobs in doing so. And another example is from the city of Winnipeg. Um, they have created a roadmap to net zero emissions, or rather they sort of hired um, a consultancy to create a roadmap for the city, um, which is called the Community Energy Investment Roadmap. It's a good, um, it's less focused on the worker side, more focused on emissions reduction, but I think there's lots of um, connections between the two and how, you know, where the job creation um, or impacts are we can expect to see as we, you know, if that plan is brought to life. Another resource um, and, you know, principle, I think, is that a just transition really needs to center Indigenous rights. Um, that's because the fossil fuel economy has really, um, you know, marginalized and dispossessed Indigenous peoples in Canada um, and, you know, extracted fossil fuels off of their territories and displaced communities without um, the benefits of the wealth accumulated from those resources going back to the communities. And so in the transition to uh, green energy or renewable economy, we need to make sure that we're not reproducing those, um, yeah, that inequity and that uh, dispossession of Indigenous people. So we need Indigenous leadership and rights to be front and center. And I'm really excited about this toolkit that um, Indigenous Climate Action and Sacred Earth Solar and other organizations released just last week um, called the Just Transition Guide. This was led by Melina Labukan Massimo, um, who's from Lubukan Lake First Nation, which is right in the heart of the tar sands. Um, and she's been working on renewable energy and just transition projects with indigenous communities across the country for uh, many years. So this toolkit really shows how indigenous communities are leading the energy transition and also how, you know, gives indigenous perspectives on a just transition and um, how, you know, we shouldn't only be thinking about emissions reduction um, and, you know, just, or even just a worker focused lens, we need to be looking more broadly at how are we transitioning the way that we relate to um, each other and the way that we relate to the land. Um, and so there's just a wealth of, of knowledge in this guidebook. If you're interested to read more, I would highly recommend it. And here is one more video I wanted to show. It's um, pretty short. This is one, uh, an example um, that's also highlighted in that Just Transition Guide of a solar project from Montana First Nation that 
I helped to work on when I worked at the Prairie Climate Center, which is based at the University of Winnipeg. Um, and this is uh, the community telling their story about switching from oil and gas to um, solar. I've heard it through elders that Mother Earth is talking and we need to listen. Climate change is here. I can feel it, I can sense it, I can see it. I think we can help change in the way we live, change in the way that we're not hurting Mother Earth. Indigenous communities can play a really big role in that. We were once a really uh, rich oil and gas nation. And over the years, as the oil and gas has gone down and no more resources were coming out of those wells, we had to make some hard changes. Five, six years ago, you know, we had to release 50% of our staff here at the nation. So the idea of solar came in to say, what if we were to put some panels on this building? Inmax came in and did a small training with some members to help do the install here on the roof. This building has a 100 kilowatt system. That's around a 60% savings for us. And that's just one of our stories. In Western Canada, we're one of the first Aboriginally owned and operated renewable energy companies. A company that'll hire our own members to install. You hire your own people, buy your people, for your people. We can do that for ourselves. We do understand these types of businesses. Someone being skilled in an area that's very new, it has increased the pride in our community. They know we have solar. They know that some houses have solar. Just seeing the kids that come in through the different programming and they say, you know, my, my dad is a solar guy and that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be able to put those panels on. And I even hear them say, um, uh, oh yeah, I'm going to buy one with a solar. <laughs> you know, like everything's now got some sort of renewables on it. going back to renewables, going back to um, low impacts, you know, and, and thinking that way scientifically, but not really, because that's just how we were already. It aligns with our values, it aligns with things that we already believe in. I'm excited about it all. It's time to organize ourselves, get together, make those plans to be sustainable. I'm excited to work in my own community and be able to plant those seeds for the next generation that's coming. I've heard it through elders that mother. So that was uh, the story of Montana First Nations transition to solar. I think it would be so great to, yeah, imagine what community owned renewable and First Nations owned community uh, renewable energy projects could look like in Manitoba. Um, and I also wanted to include a little piece on health, given the healthcare context that um, we're talking in. And so, of course, you know, climate change has uh, big impacts on health. I'm sure that most folks are aware um, of that. There's some, again, on the Climate Atlas of Canada from the Prairie Climate Centre, there's some good information about um, just sort of overview of some of the health impacts of climate change, which I won't really get into here. But um, there's a resource if you want to look further. Um, and there's some really great work being done by health professionals in across the country advocating for a just transition and climate action in various campaigns. Um, two of the groups that I just wanted to highlight here are the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment, which folks might be aware of. Um, CAPE actually recently put out a climate change toolkit for health professionals, which is a really great resource, and they are doing extensive campaigning across the country. Um, they, they do also have staff and a volunteer committee here in Winnipeg um, for those interested to reach out. 
So this, um, when we were going to do this workshop in person, I thought we could brainstorm a bit about what types of actions um, that come to mind in terms of working towards a just transition or more generally climate action in Manitoba. I think um, one thing that often, maybe the first thing that often comes to mind um, for people when I talk to them is like individual actions. So things that we can do um, at home, you know, to reduce our uh, carbon emissions. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but I, I would also encourage you to think about what types of collective action um, you can participate in because I am, am a firm believer in, uh, <laughs> in, you know, the, that we have more power together than we do um, as individuals. And so here are some ideas that came to mind, <coughs> excuse me. Um, just a few ideas, uh, writing letters to your representatives um, or emails, but I have heard from government that handwritten letters, like actual mail really goes a long way um, in terms of the impact because it's just a, a physical, sign that's harder for them to ignore, um, sharing information in your networks. And on the collective action side, you know, there are lots of great organizations in Winnipeg and across the country who are working for climate action in, you know, on the housing side or on the healthcare side or in any different sort of intersection of this issue because it cross it cuts across so much of what we do. Um, the Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition is just one of, of many. Um, so I would encourage folks who are interested in, in participating in more collective action to think of, look into what those community groups are. Um, or maybe there is you know, a group of your friends or um, within your workplace or place of worship or so on that you would be interested in you know, organizing, getting together to write um, a letter or um, do phone banking to call your your elected representatives all of those impacts can really go a long way especially when we bring together the people um that we have in our networks and so what i'd hope to do in this workshop which i invite you to do at home if you are inspired is to um, write letters to our elected officials um, and that can be anyone that you um that you'd like. One person, well, there's a number of ministers I've highlighted here in the new provincial government who are relevant. Um, Tracy Schmidt is the new Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and I think is, you know, very uh, eager to hear from people now that she's in this new position, is my understanding, um, to hear from you about your concerns or priorities related to climate change, climate action, what you would like to see the province working on. Um, you can also write to your own MLA or MP or counselor. Um, and another option would be to make a sign and send, you know, post a photo of yourself with that sign of what you're sort of, what you're asking for from government online or send it to them directly. Um, the Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition will also be hosting an action um, or an event this next upcoming Sunday, um, which I think is November 19th, um, where we'll be sending, taking a series of photos with um, signs to send to government. So if you want to join in, reach out to um, MEJC on social media. And here are just a few ideas um, to get the juices flowing in terms of what you might incorporate into your letter. Um, I think, you know, just a letter saying that you're concerned about climate change and you want to see the government take serious action would go a long way. I think that the provincial government in particular really needs to hear that. Um, but if you want to get more specific, um, here are some ideas around, you know, different actions that could be taken to um, address climate change and work towards the just transition in across many different um, sectors. 
So feel free to pause here if you um, do want to write a quick letter. Um, and I can also send this along with the recording. And that's it. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, apologies that I wasn't able to do this recording or this workshop in person. Um, but I would be happy to hear from you if you want to reach out. Um, you can reach me through the Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition um, on social media, or you can email info at mbenergyjustice.org. Thanks so much.